Hello, and welcome back. My name is Ryan. I'm a guide here at Hearst Castle. Uh, this is going to be the final episode of Hearst the Publisher. I hope everybody out there is doing okay. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that during this ongoing coronavirus pandemic, California has mandated the wearing of face masks in all indoor and outdoor public areas, as well as maintaining at least six feet of physical distancing at all times. This is not just for your safety, but for the safety of others around you as well. Hearst Castle still remains closed to the public at this time. A visionary is a person of unusually keen foresight. In 1903, William Randolph Hearst married Millicent Wilson, and he took her on a honeymoon trip to Europe. And as they drove through the countryside, he saw a British magazine aimed at car lovers. And he decided that, well, there should be a magazine for American automobile owners as well. So Hearst created his first magazine, Motor. In 1905, he concluded negotiations to buy Cosmopolitan, uh, which was his uh, first general interest magazine, but his advisors were unanimously opposed to this idea, stating that newspaper publishers did not publish magazines. They said that the two media had dissimilar audiences, distinct editorial and publication requirements, and very, dis very different distribution practices. A lot of ID uh, reasons why it was a very bad idea. But Hearst was uh, persistent and continued anyhow, very confident that he could succeed with the monthly as he had with the daily, and he was correct. To date, magazines such as L, Esquire, Good Housekeeping, Harper's Bazaar, Marie Claire, Men's Health, Women's Health, 17, and many more make up the roster of Hearst Corporation's business assets, and they still run Cosmopolitan today. In the 1920s, about a decade and a half later, Hearst would have his sights fixed on a very different form of media. In fact, the most popular growing media source in the world at the time, radio. Hearst was admittedly a nut on publicity, and ever since he gained control of his father's newspaper in the 1880s, he began using every method he could think of to promote his publications. Billboards and posters, newsreels and serial films, contests, etc. But he had a hunch that the future, as he tried to convince his editors and publishers, was going to be in radio. His goal was to cover the country with Hearst-affiliated radio stations and the Hearst brand name in entertainment and news to listeners rather than readers. He said, I personally believe that radio promotion is the greatest promotion in the world today, and our institution is years behind the times in radio. But the publishers on his executive council were not enthusiastic or willing to finance that endeavor. So, he turned to his West Coast publishers instead. He telegrammed, I think the Los Angeles Examiner should develop a really great radio program and should report all games and events of importance and uh, give bulletin news and lectures by important and amusing people in addition to the best music in Los Angeles. And because sports promised the largest national audience, it was also a natural complement to the sports coverage in the evening newspapers, and it was relatively cheap to produce, Hearst felt that that was the best place to begin, and once again, his instincts proved correct and lucrative. And now a little Colgate girl, Cal Bruce sings, Taking a Chance on Love. Take it, Cal. <laughs> I'm hearing trumpets blow again All the glow again Taking a chance on love Here I slide again About to take that ride again 
Throughout the over 130 years since Hearst started his media business, the Hearst Corporation has continued to expand, employing bold original thinking, pushing boundaries, and always embracing the newest technology of the day in order to grow with a clear intent on redefining what a media company is. William Randolph Hearst passed away in 1951 at the age of 88. But before he did, he purchased a television broadcast station, WBAL, in Baltimore. Without living long enough to see how television would evolve over the decades, I can only imagine what he would have thought of not only TV, but the internet, iPhones, Facebook, Twitter, and being the voracious art collector that he was, eBay. Of course, we know he would have wholeheartedly embraced them. But thanks to the Hearst Corporation, we don't have to just wonder. We can see in real time how his successors have carried the torch inspired by his original vision. A vision that was embracing competition instead of running away from it. A vision that had no fear. And a vision that was always looking toward the future. It's always difficult taking a topic like publishing and the history of journalism and attempt to condense it into bite-sized bits of information. But I hope that I have, at the very least, given you enough information to spark some interest or curiosity, and perhaps you even learn something new. Here at Hearst Castle, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with you a little history about the man who shaped so much of how we receive and perceive media as we know it today, for better and worse. Everything in existence has an origin story, even if we're not aware of its beginning. As Hearst was once influenced by Pulitzer all those years ago, seeking the limelight with every business decision that he made, the Hearst Corporation today is not so interested in being the center of attention, instead operating quietly behind the scenes, and their holdings influence us every day whether we realize it or not. The Hearst Corporation has continued the tradition of publishing newspapers and magazines, broadcasting radio and television, and they have holdings in BuzzFeed, the History Channel, the Lifetime Channel, ESPN, A&E, continuing on with a list we wouldn't have time to complete. Oh, and remember that feud between Hearst and Pulitzer all those years ago? Well, the irony being that Hearst's second son, William Randolph Hearst Jr., won a Pulitzer Prize for his interview with the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev in 1955, just four years after his father passed away. I want to thank you all for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of all of us here at Hearst Castle, we hope that you and your loved ones are well. And we look forward to the day when we can have you come up here and we can have these conversations with you once again in person. But until that day comes, please stay safe and we will see you next time.